hi friends welcome to our 40 days new life journey now we've been away for quite a while i know that and a lot has been happening to us as always but this time exciting things um i'm really fully engaged in some training doing something different as usual but you know me when i've learned something new i always come and share with you so just keep your fingers crossed for me because it's something really exciting that I'm taking on another journey but a new life journey um, a new life the 40 day journey continues we did make a covenant with you we did make a promise with you that we're gonna finish this book so no matter how long it takes us we will continue to do it until we finish it um, another exciting thing that happened to me again was um, I came across another amazing person on YouTube his name is L A Ewing, um, E W I N G. A, a client of mine recommended I should watch him, and I did. And amazing things happen when you really listen to other people, people who also have experienced life and are struggling with life, and then have made sense of it. So this amazing man, I learned so much about how you know, no matter how things are difficult, it's about prayers, it's about, it's about fasting. Is about sharing with other people given to the needy given to the poor so go and check him out and hear him talk to you as well because it really did touch me and it now made this even more exciting for me because it showed that we are actually on the right path in life trying to make sense of you know our existence here so this is the book we are working on um warren brick warren and um the purpose driven life what on earth am i here for so today we're on day 34 chapter 34 and we're going to carry on again uh, before i carry on thank you to everyone who's been watching this program um we get all your amazing comments and we really want to appreciate all of you and tell you that we are more than happy to have you getting involved in this and making changes and making sense of your life um I'm going to really flip through as quickly as I can because time again is of the essence for all of us. I know you're busy and we're equally very busy. So we don't want to hold anyone too much um, stuck in front of a camera. But this is what it is. We'll make sure we finish this chapter today and then carry on with the next chapter as, as it flows. So day 34, chapter 34. So, if I didn't mention Joy Fido International is the channel we're coming from with everything to do with supporting your mental growth, supporting you, inspiring you to success, inspiring you to have a better life. And my name is Joy Fido. So today, the title is Thinking Like a Servant. That's what the title is. We're trying to think like a servant. It says, my servant Caleb thinks differently and follows me completely. And this is in Numbers 14, um, verse 24. Think of yourself the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. And this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. You know, he normally gives us like a, a few verses to really think about, and then we we'll go deeper into it. So it says, service starts in your mind. Whatever service you're taking on starts in your mind. And to be a servant requires a mental shift, a change in your attitude. So what creates service or what creates that ability to be a servant is a mental shift. It's something that starts from our mind. And God is always more interested in why we do something than what we do. Why do we do this? That's what God wants to know, not what we are doing. Um, attitudes count more than achievements so your attitude to something is a lot more than what you achieve and as usual you know we tend to forget that the attitude is what makes the person because situations always change but what attitude do you have towards whatever that situation is that comes your way so King Amaziah lost God's favor because he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not with a true heart. So you see, sometimes we do things. We may do this thing because, so yeah, this is, we just have to do it. But is our heart really true towards that thing that we're doing? And this king lost 
his you know lost his relationship with God because he was doing something without a true heart he says real servants serve God with a mindset of five attitudes so today we are going to be focusing on these five attitudes that is what God is really expecting from us and number one is servants think more about others than about themselves so if you're in a position where you really want to serve others you should think more about others than about yourself this is one big problem we all deal with as people we are tending always to think about ourselves it's always about me 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 and that way we tend to forget about other people but what he's trying to remind us here is we should think about others more than we think about ourselves and you know i mentioned the gentleman that i watch his videos on youtube talking about fasting and prayers and sharing with people who don't have as much as we do and i realized something i wasn't doing right with fasting because i know about fasting but i've never really taken it on and when you do take it on it's not just about you denying yourself of something because that's what fasting is about jesus took on a 40 day 40 night fast before he could take on the ministry so when you take on fasting it's not just you denying yourself i'm not going to be eating i'm not going to be smoking i'm not going to be so you take on all of those but what do you do while you're denying yourself of something that's what's really most important you need to start giving to others who don't have as much as you do and that's where i realized that i wasn't really focusing on that part of my life and that's one thing that i've done that's changed things around for me as well so we tend to think so much more about ourselves than about other people that's not what god wants from us he wants us to think of other people you remember the story am i my brother's keeper we need to be our brother's keepers so it says servants focus on others, not on themselves. And this is true humility. Not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. Do you get this message? Not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. So yes, you do think of yourself, but you're not doing it as more often as you normally would. And so you do not spend all your find all your time thinking of only yourself you give other people space in your thoughts think of a mother that's what mothers do mothers just generally think about everybody around them because that instinct has been put into us so have you ever wondered how a mother with eight children think she suddenly becomes secondary as her children become primary so everybody around her gets more attention than she would give to herself as a child, I saw my mother behave like this, including all my family friends. My mom was the most selfless person I knew. I wonder why she was like that. As an adult now, I can relate to it. Because as a mother now, I know what it means to make sure I'm providing for my children. I know what it means to now think of other people out there on the streets, relatives, friends, people I meet on the streets who ask me for favors, who are begging for something. That's what thinking less about yourself is about. They say self forgetful. So why are we not thinking of how we can do less for just ourselves? He says, Paul said, forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. So if you think of yourself a bit less, you will be more than excited to give other people a hand. And this is what it means to lose your life. Remember, when um, uh, uh, Christ said, the Bible says, um, what will it take for you to gain the whole world and lose your life? Because now you're thinking it's all about you and you just want to gain the whole world. So this is where people start being extremely selfish and they want to own everything. He said, when we stop focusing on our own needs, we'll become aware of the needs of other people around us. Because we're constantly thinking only about what we want. We don't then remember what other people around us are looking for as well. Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus, God's son, came to this world. What did he do? If you look at the story of Jesus and look at his entire existence, you're going to see all the time he was there serving people. 
when was the last time you emptied yourself for someone else or someone else's benefit you say you can't be a servant if you're full of yourself it's only when we forget ourselves that we do the things that deserve to be remembered because we're constantly all about ourselves like we don't even do anything that people remember anymore because it's all about us unfortunately a lot of our services often self-serving self-serving that's the word because we're always only about who we want to be and about ourselves so we serve to get others to like us to be admired or to achieve our own goals that is manipulation not ministry this is because the whole time we're really thinking about ourselves and how noble and wonderful we are so constantly we're doing things just to make us look admirable by everybody people to praise us people to tell us how amazing we are so it's all self-serving and when we finish doing things like that people don't remember anything anymore because it was always all about yourself i mean today i i had um some messages on facebook and people were talking about martyrs and um people who had given their own lives in order to save other people it was rather weird that people were just talking, you know, ridiculously insulting people who had given their lives to other people. I had to, you know, wade into this conversation and said, excuse me, people like Martin Luther King gave his life in order for other people to see goodness in life. People like uh, uh, Gandhi did the same thing in, in, um, in India. In Ogoni, where I come from, Kensari, what did the same thing for his own people. So you do not sit there when you haven't been put in a position where you can actually give something to other people and you start insulting people who gave their life for other people. Now, when it's time to think, when history starts to count, people like that are constantly remembered. And that's what this is all about. It's about you remembering that other people exist other than yourself. He you said, some people try to use service as a bargaining tool with God. I'll do this for you, God, if you'll do something for me. That's not what it should be. That's not what it should be. It's not, it's not about give and take. You give me something, then I'll give you something. You just have to be ready to give. Real servants don't try to use God for their purposes. Um, we are live on Instagram, I understand. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to chat with us. But I know we've been away for so long, so they, they, they focus sometimes. People move on with their life and carry on with other things. So if you don't remember where we stopped, just carry on with us. And then um, we keep trying our best to keep coming back whenever we can. So real servants don't try to use God for their purposes. They let God use them for his purposes. So we don't go to God and say, God, if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. We allow God to walk through us. And so when I watch that man, the man I talked about, Erwin, and I know the kind of things I like to share with you, I am not coming here and saying to God, if only I'll get uh, 20 million viewers on one uh, program, then I will come and share my message or the message that you put in me. No, I come here because I have it deep in my, my soul, my person. I have a passion to share what I know, and that's why I come. And that's why you will not see us chasing you like I watch on a YouTube channel and you hear people go, give me 50,000 likes and I'll give you this. That's not what you're doing for God. You're doing that for yourself. And so when you have a bigger message from God to share, you will share that message because the message needs to be shared, not because you're going to get something back in return. So thinking like a servant is difficult. And Mr. Lyon said the quality of self-forgetfulness, like faithfulness, is, is extremely rare. Self-forgetfulness, just like faithfulness, is extremely rare to find. Thinking like a servant is difficult because it's challenging. It challenges the basic problem of life. People don't want to be servants. Everyone, everyone wants to be the master. You so say we are by nature selfish. That's a general habit of human beings. We just want to keep to ourselves. We want to provide just for ourselves and our family. We think mostly about ourselves. This is why humility is a daily struggle. 
You barely see humble people these days. Because everybody is so arrogant and so full of themselves. He says it's a lesson we should all learn over and over. The opportunity to be a servant confronts us dozens of times in a day in which we are given the choice to decide between meeting our own needs or the needs of others. This is something that is just normal in life. Every day we are put in a position where we could serve people, but we choose most times not to. So self-denial is the core of servanthood. Self-denial. So when you deny yourself, remember I mentioned about fasting where you deny yourself of something. That is one of the core of being a servant of God. He said, this is so important in life. Fasting is a good example, which I've just mentioned. You stop what your body enjoys doing. So eating food, drinking alcohol for men, womanizing and gossiping for women, being greedy, being selfish, given to others. All of these things are so important that for most of us, we cannot do without them. But this is what God expects us to deny ourselves of. Once we can deny ourselves of these things, things start to change in our life. And so this is one of the tests God gives us to see how committed we are to restore spirituality. So the minute you start denying yourself of some things, some other parts of your life starts to grow better. That's what spirituality is about. And I never understood in all these years what fasting was all about. I just thought it's just denying, not, not eating food. No, there's a lot more to it. And so when you actually commit yourself to fasting, you find that your spirituality grows stronger. The part of you that you cannot touch starts to get a higher esteem in your life. By fasting or self-denial, we lose grip of our physical needs and grow in spirituality. And like I said, I have tried it and it is not the easiest thing to do. For, for, for Jesus to have gone through 40 days of this, I've just been trying like seven days, five days sometimes, and it is hard. But people do 21 days, people do 40 days like Jesus did, and I've heard of people who do 60 days. The minute you can do these things, your spirituality starts to grow and things start to change the way you think. You see, this is why he said it is easier for a camel's head to go through the eyes of a needle than for most of us to go to heaven. Because most of us struggle to deny ourselves of some basic things. Most of people like Christianity is about just singing and praising and speaking in tongues. For most people, Let's just go to church and clap our hands and dance and, you know, sing the, scream the highest hallelujah and come out and nothing has changed in their life. So it is more about self-denial and give to those who lack. When you start doing that, you start becoming a servant. This explains why our salvation is solely in our hands. And I tell you, most times as Christians, we go, we say, can this pastor pray for me? Can that pastor pray for me? And you think things are going to change in your life. Nobody can fast for you. So that tells you that there's something that is really outstanding there that we are not doing as a people. No pastor can fast on your behalf. You have to fast for yourself. So like they pray for you, your family cannot fast for you. Your husband cannot fast for you. Your wife cannot fast for you. Your children cannot fast for you. You cannot fast for your children. So everybody's spirituality, it's in their hands. Your, your, your dealings with God, it's in your own hands. So you cannot, um, this is something we all have to do for ourselves. Self-denial. It is our thing. We can measure our servants heart by how we respond when others treat us like servants. So he's given us another example. How do you respond when you're taken for granted? When you're bossed around, when you're treated as an inferior, how do you respond to that? He said, the Bible says, if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use this occasion to practice the life of being a servant. And so number two point, servants think like stewards, not owners. 
servants remember that God owns it all. In the Bible, a steward was a servant entrusted to manage an estate. Joseph was this kind of servant as a prisoner in Egypt. Potiphar entrusted Joseph with his home. Then Dijela entrusted Joseph with his jail. Eventually, Pharaoh entrusted an entire nation to Joseph. Servanthood and stewardship go together since God expects us to be trustworthy in both of them. The Bible says the one thing requested, required of such servants is that they be faithful to their masters. So whenever you are entrusted with roles to play, you have to be faithful to your master. How are you handling the resources God had entrusted to you? And this is where, again, we begin to show up in this whole discussion. God has given us so much as individuals. We all each have something that he wants us to do. What are you doing with yours? And I can tell you I'm doing something, sharing my message, sharing what I know, talking about skills that I have. That is me doing God's work. It is for you now to start finding out the things that God has put into your hands. And you do it. Because when you do it, you're actually responding to your master. You're being faithful to your master. And so, to become a rich servant, you are going to have to settle the issue of money in your life. Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. He did not say you should not, but you cannot. It is impossible. And this is one of the things he mentioned in the book. So it is impossible living for ministry and living for money are mutually exclusive goals. Which one will you choose? And this is the scenario where you have and you do not want to give to others. You want to keep it all to yourself. If you're a servant of God, you cannot moonlight for yourself. All your time belongs to God. He insists on exclusive allegiance, not part-time faithfulness. Money has the greatest potential to replace God in your life. In most, most of our lives, once we start thinking of money, thinking of money, we forget that there is a creator that sent us here. More people are sidetracked from serving by materialism than by anything else. Remember that saying again, easier to, uh, for a camel to go through the half a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because we tend to think materialism all the time. They say, after I achieve my financial goals, I'm going to serve God. That's what most people do when money becomes the main thing they think about in life. That is a foolish decision because they will regret this for eternity. When Jesus is your master, money serves you. Money will serve you when you are committed to God. Because when money comes your way, there is a purpose for that money. Not the other way around. Money serves you when you instruct money to take on projects that help people. Money serves a purpose for you and other people. This is what goes on in civilized worlds. Money serves a purpose, not money for the sake of money. On the other hand, when money is your master, you will become a slave to money. Whatever people say you should do for money, you will do it. That becomes slavery. This is what happens in other developed countries. In Africa, in Nigeria in particular, single individuals will amass money that belong to the country onto themselves. At this stage, what, what, what is going on? They are now serving money. And there are so many names I could mention regarding this. They fill their bank accounts, they buy houses all over the world where they would not live. They live in only one place because you're only one person. But you bought property all over the world. Now, what is going on? You're saving money. Money is not saving you. You are saving money. So, these people, instead of using this money that has come into, uh, you, you know, in their, in their, in their, act, act they can access, to use to create things for the children of God across the countries that they have access to or that, that they are supposedly leading, they take the money out of the system. Now, by so doing, they, they deprive God's children of the necessities of life. You are now saving money. Money is not saving you anymore. Because money will save you if you give instruction to money to do the right things in the world. Basic things 
roads, electricity, water, hospitals, all of these things, nothing happened in countries like this. These monies are sent away to buy ridiculous homes across the world. Wealth in itself is not a sin, but failing to use wealth for God's glory is where the problem is. Because when you behave like this, you're no longer serving God. You're serving money. And so God said, go here and multiply, not to go and hold on to what was supposed to be for everybody. Most people think go here and multiply means go and have more children. It means go and spread my words. Go and share the knowledge I've given you. Go and give other people access to whatever you have access to. So, he created us in his image coming from a creative father. We are meant to be creative people. Not just wait for other people to create things, then we enjoy them. We need to create things for God too. Because when he created us and stopped on that seventh day, he told us go and carry on from there. And that's why you see people who contribute to the world achieve so much. Because they have just followed the instructions of God and done what he asked us to do. Servants of God are more concerned about ministry than money, about sharing, about giving, about creating new things. Bible is clear, God uses money to test our faithfulness as servants. That is why Jesus talked more about money than he did about either heaven or hell. He said, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Because the riches obviously are in heaven. So if you cannot handle the wealth here, the worldly wealth here, how can you possibly fall into the glory of God in heaven? How we manage money affects how God truly blesses our lives. Remember money is not the only blessings we get. We are blessed with peace of mind. We are blessed with true happiness. We are blessed with health. We are blessed with long life. We are blessed with happy children, focused children, and the list goes on. But most people think blessings is only when we have money. That's not the only blessings that we get from God. There are, there are kingdom builders and wealth builders. And both of them are gifted making a business grow. Making deals or, or sales and making a profit. Wealth builders continue to amass wealth for themselves no matter how much they make. But kingdom builders change the rules of the game. They try to make as much money as they can, but do it in order to give it away, to do things for other people. They use the world to fund God's work and his ministry in the world. They encourage each other to become kingdom builders in your church. Contribute to growing other people. Just like Peter said, I think Jesus told Peter, come and be a fisher of men. Not just a fisherman, fisher of men. So the more you can do for other people, the more you're making God happy. And so the third one is servants think about their work, not what others are doing. So if you're a servant of God, you'll be thinking of what you are contributing to God's kingdom than to watch and see what other people are doing and see if they're making sense. And I tend to find this a lot from most people. This is where envy comes in. This is where greed, co um, selfishness comes in. This is where um, jealousy comes in. People just want to see what other people are doing before they can decide what they would do. What stops you from being original? He said they don't compare, they don't, they don't criticize or com uh, compete with other ministers. So these are servants of God. They don't compete. They just do what God has told them to do. They're too busy doing the work God has given them. Competition between God's servants is illogical for many reasons. This is such a good example because when I operate here, like if you're a constant um, viewer of our channel, which I believe you are, because I notice that most of the people that watch these programs are usually our very, very faithful uh, uh, viewers who come because they see the message, they see the sense in what we talk about. 
you will find that our channel is not focused on doing the one thing we just want to share as much we know as possible with you so we don't sit here and start poking into other people's channels and say oh let, let me see what they're doing then i can go and do that because you remember we started with hair and i know there's so many channels who have come long after we started that are doing amazing things with hair business i am proud of them because i have been one of those people who actually encouraged the growth of this hair business but it has not stopped me from doing other things i am more than excited hopping into as many things that god has put into my knowledge as possible i am not sitting down envying and being angry that other people are doing what i did do it just shows that people are growing it shows that everybody is picking up knowledge and we are all getting better with the knowledge that we've acquired from other sources just like i mentioned the young man uh, uh erwin when i hear other people talk and make sense that's really touched me i will share their message i will talk about it that's what people god's servants do they share they want other people to grow it's not just about themselves so competition is not necessary at all we are all on the same team our goal is to make god look good not ourselves it's not about us it's about god we've been we've been given different assignments and we are all uniquely shaped we talked about the shaping earlier in this book we are all differently gifted there's something about each of us that god said this is yours now once you know what yours is why do you go envying other people why do you go jealous in other people why do you why do you want to compete I mean, there's something they call healthy competition. But healthy competition is about knowing, oh, yeah, you're doing that. Oh, I would like to do similar. Okay, no problem. I will go and do it my own way. Not get angry that another person is doing something that I do or did. Anyway, so these are the messages. We've been given different assignments and we are all uniquely shaped. So there is no need for the jealousy and the enviousness across board. Paul said, we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another one of us worse. Nobody is worse and nobody is better. We are all uniquely shaped. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. Each one of us on this earth, seven billion of us are all originals. And this is where when people start saying, but I don't do it like that person does, it does my head in because you are different. There is no place of petty jealousy between servants. When you are busy serving, you don't have time to be critical. Now that brings me to people who just want to sit there and most them speak only negatives whenever they're watching other people's channels. We are all uniquely made create your own channel if you find somebody is doing what you don't like irritates your skin that's not how it should have been done go and create yours so that you also have a following people who think like you that's how it should be not throwing out negativity all the time it's not necessary it does not take anybody anywhere it does not make your life better to be negative so any time spent criticizing others is time that could be spent ministering do you get the message the time you spend criticizing people you could have been using that time to bring out your creativity your uniqueness what makes you stand out that's the big message in this in this chapter learn to work with other people learn to serve learn to give what god has given you when Martha complained to Jesus that Mary was not helping with the work, she lost her servant's heart. Remember the story? I think one of them was um, rubbing oil on Jesus' feet and the other one said, but there was so much work to be done in the kitchen. Why are you there doing that? Real servants don't complain of unfairness. Don't have pity, uh, they call it pity party. Americans love that. 
Oh, pity party. So, look at poor me. Feel sorry for me. Look at only my life is like this and like that. He said, real servants don't do that. They don't, they don't have time to create that scenario where people should pity them. They don't resent those not serving. They just trust God and keep serving. That's what real servants do. It is not our job to evaluate the masters or the servants. It's not our job to sit back and say, and that one's not doing that, and that one's... Because how did you see that person? You saw that person because you were not doing anything. You could only see when you're doing nothing. If you are busy, trust me, you will not even know what's happening around you. Bible says, who are you to criticize someone else's servants? The Lord will determine whether his servant has been successful. It is also not our job to defend ourselves against criticism. Let our master handle it. So most times, you get all, I get all the negativities and I just say, okay, whatever. I mean, this is so interesting, especially on Instagram. And I get the attacks and the attacks and the attacks. And all I say to people like that, thank you so much for watching. Thank you. You've been really kind. Thank you for your comment. And now people are used to it. That I don't have the energy to be arguing with people. Because if I'm arguing, where is the time that I will use in creating things to share with you? Let us follow the example of Moses, who showed true humility in the face of opposition. As did Nehemiah, whose response to critics was simply, my work is too important to stop now and visit with you. Do you get the message? When people start picking on you and criticizing you, and you know what they normally want? They want you to come back at them. They want you to argue with them. They want you to set up a scene and let's, let's do this. You know when people want to fight outside and go, okay, come on then, let's do this. They are waiting for you to come. And Nehemiah said, my work is too important to stop now and visit with you. So he's too busy. He doesn't have the time to sit and be arguing with you because he has enough on his hands. So that's the reality of servants. When you are busy, you don't have time to be given a comeback. Let's do this. Let's argue. If you serve Jesus, you can expect to be criticized. That's just normal. And I sometimes I just tell people, you know what? Jesus was the purest of human beings, the best of hearts. He did everything he could, including giving his life to us. But what did we do as people? We still chose him to be the one to be hung. We still criticize him to this day. So I don't know what other human being on this earth that cannot be criticized. So it just comes with the territory. So he's telling us now that if you serve Jesus, you can expect to be criticized. The world and even much of the church does not understand what God's value is. One of the most beautiful acts of love shown to Jesus was criticized by the disciples. Mary took the most valuable thing she owned, expensive perfume, and poured it over Jesus. Her lavish service was called a waste by the disciples. Jesus called it significant, and that's all that mattered. Because Mary felt, oh my God, this is my God, and she took her expensive oil, and she rubbed on Jesus' feet. And the disciples were angry. Why are you wasting that oil? Jesus was shocked. And Jesus said, All I know is Mary has done something extremely significant. But as humans, we didn't see it. Your service to Christ is never wasted, regardless of what other people say. So for as long as you're doing what God has asked you to do, something that's come straight from your heart, this is something that you are honored to be doing. Don't worry about the criticism. It will always be there. That's just human nature. So the next one, servants base their identity in Christ. As God's children, we remember we are loved and accepted by grace. Servants don't have to prove their worth. They willingly accept jobs that insecure people would consider beneath them. So as a servant, your job, just get on with whatever God has asked you to do. It's nothing to do with 
this is not up to my standard. This is beneath my standard. They willingly accept their jobs that insecure people will consider beneath them. One of the most profound examples of serving from a secure self-image is Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Remember that scenario when Jesus had to wash the feet of the disciples. Now this is Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. It should be the other way around. But that just shows you the kind of person Jesus was. Washing feet was the equivalent of being a shoe shine boy. A job devoid of status. But Jesus knew who he was, so the tax didn't threaten his self image. How many of us today will do that? Will go and really serve? How many of our fake celebrity pastors that we deal with in this present day and time in this world are massing wealth from the lowly people, their little money they go and put it in church, and then this pastor goes to buy? So what do they call them? Jets, private jets and travel the world and cannot travel with regular people. How many of them will wash the feet of their congregation? That goes to show you the life we're living in right now. So the Bible says Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God. So he got up from the mill took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. If you're going to be a servant, you must settle your identity in Christ. So if Christ could do all this for us, what stops us, mere mortals, from serving other people? If you're going to be a servant, only secure people can serve. Insecure people are always worrying about how they appear to others. Insecure people worry about the image that others are seeing. They don't worry about the image that comes from inside. They fear exposure of their weakness and they hide beneath layers of protective pride and pretensions. So, I am so arrogant, I am so proudful, I have so much pride, I cannot, this is beneath me, I cannot do that, that's not for me. That's insecure people. He says layers of pretensions. That's what we wear. Different layers. People's, I know people who own businesses that cannot sweep the floor in the shop. They cannot go to the toilet and clean it. These are things I just do on a daily basis. So, servants do not pick and choose. The more insecure you are, the more you will want people to serve you. Do you get that? So we need to really look at ourselves and understand what service to God means. The more you will need people's approval. So you cannot be anything without, what do you think of what I'm wearing? And what do you think? What did you, did you hear what that person said about me? What do you think of that? And so you're constantly wanting to hear what people think. Africa, Nigeria especially is built on master servant relationship and this just tells you when we begin to open the layers of what true servants are people love names people love to be seen on the high table i'm not going to even go into more of explaining how i saw this because time is not on my side on that one but i'll carry on with the message he's giving Henry Noven said, in order to be of service to others, we have to die for them. That is, we have to give up measuring our meaning and value with the yastic of others. Thus, we become free to be compassionate. When you base your worth and identity on your relationship to Christ, you are freed from the expectations of others. And that allows you to really serve them best. Servants don't need to cover their walls with plaques and awards to validate their work. And this just resonates with me so much. I remember years ago when I started the hair business and I remember all these events and people come, come and get this award and get that award. And I, I, I had to ask myself, what, who has given this award for what? You don't even know what I do, but you want to give me an award for what you don't know? And so this is when you start wondering and knowing the people who are as fake as they come. 
they want to have a huge award on the wall to prove that this is them. But if you know what you're doing, you don't need that award. You just need to do what you know how to do. They don't, they don't insist on being addressed by titles and they don't wrap themselves in robes of superiority. Again, this, this resonates with me because I really cannot handle people who have superior uh, uh, complexes, people who think they are better than other people. Because I can fit into any role. I can be a servant, I can be a master, I can be anything. And that just says the personality that God has given me. But when people like to just remain in that one role, I'm the superior. Now that is where there is a problem. Servants find status symbols unnecessary. I don't do them. And they don't measure their worth by their achievement. They're not going to come and tell you, oh, look at the things I achieved and look at the things I achieved. This, this is what makes me... Servants don't do that. They just do their job. Paul said, you may brag about yourself, but the only approval that counts is the Lord's approval. So when we do all these things on this earth and we want to show up to everybody and we want to tell the world how great we are, it says the only approval that counts is the one from God. That's the only approval that counts. So if anyone had the chance of a lifetime to flaunt his connections and name drop, name drop it was James. This was a good example. He said if anyone among the people who served during the time of Jesus had the opportunity to be a name dropper, it would have been James, the half brother of Jesus. He had the credentials of growing up with Jesus as his brother. Yet in introducing his letter, he simply referred to himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was just a good example. James had the opportunity. He's Jesus' half brother. He could have gone singing on the mountain top. Look at me. I am. But he never did that. He said, I'm a servant of God. And I'm true. Jesus Christ. The closer you get to know Jesus, the less you need to promote yourself. The less you need to all about you and nobody else. The more you need to focus on the job at hand. Because remember, time is of essence for all of us on this earth. We need to start focusing on what we can contribute to life. Then just Picking and picking on things that don't count. And I watch these things on all the social media and it just makes me laugh. Servants think of ministry as an opportunity, not an obligation. And so that's the fifth one. They enjoy helping people, meeting needs and doing ministry. That's what a servant should be doing. They serve the Lord with gladness. They are happy to do what God wants them to do. Why do they serve with gladness? Because they love the Lord. They are grateful for His grace. They know serving is the highest use of life. And they know God has promised a reward. Okay, yes. You just appreciate the fact that you are alive. That's the biggest role. Because for every day we wake up, there is something you haven't done and that's why we're still here. So the biggest thing we could do as servants of God is to carry on ministering. Ministering in so many forms. Continuing the will of God in our life. Carry on with the messages he's given us. Do the things he wants us to do. I know of a friend of mine who runs a charity in her country. And this woman commits. Does everything she can to get things across to these young children in her country. Now that is ministry. It's not about herself. And I know when I have the opportunity to give people, I am more humble and happy to do that, which I am working on. But I want you to also work on that. I want all of us to create a better world for all of us. Jesus promised the, the Father will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Paul said he will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for others. Remember what I said about fasting? When you watch Ewan's video, this is one of the things he talks about that really struck a chord with me. 
when you're fasting this is the time it's not saying that you shouldn't give normally you give just make it a habit to give to other people because I watched a video recently on Facebook and this man also was talking about giving to God and one of the biggest mistakes we do as Christians is making sure that we do that tithing because the churches pick on the one part of the Bible about tithing. This man explained tithing that shocked me. It wasn't meant to be something that was now meant to be stuck compulsorily on people. The bigger message is for us to share with people who don't have. To give to people who are less fortunate than we are. But what do we do? We make sure we take that 10% to church. And then what happens? The pastor takes it to go and buy his private jet and wear his designer clothes and designer watches and designer whatever. He and his wife and his household and go around the world buying houses as usual, the corrupt corruptness that human beings just are. And then he hides under he's doing it for God. And the same Church members who contributed this tithe to the church cannot even send their children to the school that this church builds because they end up building amazing schools, which is a good thing, but then they end up giving the schools to children of wealthy homes who can afford to pay this, the school fees that the school wants. These poor people who pay the 10% have been thrown out of the scene. So, the bigger message for us is to learn to give to people who lack. We should learn to give to people who are less fortunate than us. It's not about throwing everything into the church, especially this kind of churches. Paul says, imagine what could happen if you just 10% of all Christians in the world got serious about their role as servants and offer service to other people. Imagine the kind of world we will have. Imagine all the good that could be done. Are, are you willing to be one of those people? So that's the question he's asking us now. It doesn't matter what your age is, what your position is, what your race is. God will use you if you will begin to act and think like a servant. And servant means service. So if you begin to offer your service to God, God will work with you. Albert Schweizer said, the only really happy people are those who have learned how to serve. Those are the only people that are really, really happy. So the question is, are you one of them? I am working hard at it, and I want you to work hard at it too. So before we finish today, points to remember. To be a servant, I must think like a servant. And the verse to remember, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. So again, we've been given instances where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. That's a good example that tells us that even in his position as the direct son of God, he did not arrogate powers upon himself, arrogance and pride and, and put himself on this pedestal and said, I cannot do this. This is beneath me. He did everything. As Christians, we are meant to be Christ-like. That's what Christianity is about. But the Christians who want to fake themselves and claim they are serving Jesus when they're not, we need to look at ourselves again, x-ray ourselves and see where we are falling short. So the question to consider is, am I usually more concerned about being served? Of finding ways to serve others. That's a question you should ask yourself today as we finish today's chapter. Are you concerned about being served rather than serving? So thank you so much. It's been quite an exciting chapter. I found it really, really um, informative and educative and something for me to think about and ponder about and see how I can add this to my life. And I hope you can do that too with your life. So as usual, I say thank you so much for watching. And thank you for being part of us. And as usual, remember to subscribe. Remember to share this with your friends. 
because there are so many people out there who need these messages from time to time to remind us of our responsibility to this world so i look forward to seeing you in the next chapter in the meantime remain blessed and let god continue to guide you